Oh, welcome aboard, whether you got here through uh, misintentions, bad luck, or making a choice, we're certainly glad that you've arrived. Welcome to Fishing Without Bait, a lifetime without definitive expectations, where we challenge people to take our full impact mindfulness technique to not walk into their life, however, explode into it, to turn your life, come out of that cocoon, come out of that shell, spread your wings and fly and turn your world into color. Today, as always, I'm joined by my good friend, co-host, and producer of this program, Mr. Mike. Mr. Mike, welcome aboard. Good to be back on. It's been a little bit. I know you've had a lot of guests on the show, so it's been a while since we've had a good conversation. Yes, it's time that we got reacquainted with each other and ourselves. And as most of our uh, listeners uh, are aware, or perhaps you are not, and Mike will give you a link to the origin story at the end of this program, uh, I am in long-term recovery from drug and alcohol addiction and have certainly had my time of troubles myself. And what really turned the corner for me was an encounter with the divine and also incorporating the 12 steps of recovery is adapted into behavioral change, Mike. There are many types of techniques, and 12-step recovery certainly doesn't have a monopoly on recovery. However, keep in mind that everyone is in recovery from something, whether it's from depression or anxiety, from alcohol, drugs, gambling, codependency, uh, eating, or maybe banana popsicles, or uh cracking your knuckles. Everybody is in recovery from something. I'm sure that there's something that perhaps you would like to modify or change in your life, Mike. I need to stop picking up Timbits when I'm on the road. Timbits, the Tim Hortons little donut uh, <laughs> deals. I'll grab like a 20 pack and just munch on that while I'm on the road. Okay. I should probably rescind from doing that. Well, you could, you could choose to, as uh, we always say. So as a, uh, preface to this, what I'd like to say is that in no way, shape, or form do I represent uh, any organization of 12-step recovery, uh, nor do I am I a spokesman for them. Absolutely not. However, everyone in their life deals with something. Most of the time, as we've discussed on this program, we live with wishes and hopes and waiting for something to happen. Do we not, Mike? Absolutely. And quite often we tell our lottery story, which we'll probably do today. So the first step in 12-step recovery, and I'm going to freely adapt this, please. If, and if anyone's offended out there, you can let us know. However, uh, we're just going to have to be offended. So we admitted we were powerless over, our, let's say, our addiction and that our lives had become unmanageable. So let's take the second part of that step first. Our lives had become unmanageable. So Mike, if... Uh, if you came to me and you said, oh, Jim, my life's unmanageable, what do you resonate that with? What do you correlate that with? Well, what's, what's an unmanageable life, Mike? Uh, to me, that's uh, I, I can't manage my time. I can't manage my emotional stasis. I can't manage uh, my family, my, uh, uh, my home. Uh, it could be all, all of those things or any one of those things are just untenable. Absolutely. What this 12-step step says to myself, and merely this is my interpretation, is that it's not the ruined finances, the broken relationships, the problems with the health, the problems with the law, uh, the financial difficulties. It's losing who you are. So I'm going to challenge everybody out there to take a good, long, hard look in the mirror and a good, long, hard look in the mirror and Tell yourself what you see, not the physical aspect of yourself, but what do you see as a person? When you had some difficult times in your life, Mike, as everyone does, and you looked in the mirror, tell me, what were you seeing? Oh, somebody that was very stressed out. Someone very stressed out, perhaps somebody sad, or perhaps somebody that you didn't know, or in the moment, didn't particularly care for. Everyone's Everyone's been there, and most people, when they're what I call out running uh, in their addiction, generally don't look in mirrors. They, don't, they generally don't like what they see. Okay, so the whole idea is about losing yourself. And one of these purposes of 12-step recovery is to 
get reacquainted with yourself. As we've done a number of podcasts on, Mike, the person you've been waiting for is yourself. To get acquainted with yourself. To get acquainted with that person in the mirror. Now, the first step of that, we admitted we're powerless, okay? As a man, do you like to admit you're powerless, Mike? No, not typically. So generally, in our individualistic type of society, we're taught that our self-will should be able to conquer any problem. And if you're not, then you're weak. What's wrong with you? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Get your blood boiling. All these type of things, okay? So, however, acceptance is always the prelude to change. Always the prelude to change. Acceptance is not defeat. There's a difference between acceptance and surrender and defeat. Let's uh, use this scenario, Mike. You and I are 10 years old and we live beside each other and we walk to school every day. Every day we walk two blocks and there's a big bully there. Just beats us up, turns us into mud, and steals our lunch money. So... In this individualistic society, we're going to go back down that road the next day. We're going to go down those same two blocks, and the bully's still going to be there. Because we feel we need to take it head on and conquer the problem. Absolutely. We We have to conquer this problem. So let's say that one day, before we go off to school, we you and I meet in the front yard and say, Hey, you know what? Let's take another way to school. There's a there's a, there's another way to school. So we go another way to school, and when we arrive at school, we're not beaten up, our clothes aren't filthy, and we still have our lunch money. Does that make us weak, Mike? No, it makes you smarter. Yes, it makes you smart. So the whole idea is working smarter, not harder. And simply because we came to the acceptance that we could not beat the bully up, or even why would we want to, we got to school, we're in good health, and we had our lunch money and able to have our lunch. So this is the part about acceptance, okay? So the part about acceptance is that, have you ever had a flat tire in your car, Mike? Yes, I have. Okay. So after you got that flat tire, did you pour gasoline on the vehicle and burn it up? Sometimes I may have wanted to. You may have liked to. Or did you just call somebody and you went and bought another car? Nope. Well, tell us what you did. No, you, uh, well, hopefully you had that spare and uh, it's not rusted in place right. as it has probably we've had before. Yeah. And uh, you figure it out and you put the tire on and, if, you, and you go to whatever you needed to do and you take care of the tire. If you don't use your tools, they are going to get rusty, correct? Exactly. Okay. So what you said is you're going to use your tools to change that flat tire. Mm-hmm. However, the first thing that you had to be aware of was what? That the tire was it was flat and done and it needed to be replaced. Right. The tire was flat and needed to be replaced. Okay. So figuratively, some people run through their life on flat tires because they're willing to accept that there's some part of their life that is unmanageable and unacceptable. But things will get better. I'll just wait and wish and hope. So the idea about this is acceptance. Acceptance is the answer to all of our problems. When I'm upset or disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some event in my life unacceptable to me. And until I can accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it is, I will have no serenity. It's not so much as what can be changed in the world. It's what can be changed in me and my attitudes. And that's freely adapted from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in the uh, story in the back of the book called Acceptance is the Answer by an individual by the name of Dr. Paul. So the first, the first step is getting in touch with yourself, recognizing that you've lost who you are, and accepting the fact that we can use some help. Accepting the fact that Perhaps this thing in front of us could be approached another way because, Mike, our way didn't work. Our way didn't work. So the second step is came to believe that a power greater than ourself could restore us to sanity. So, Mike, uh, we've talked about this on past uh, podcasts about Einstein's definition of an insanity. Doing the same thing 
over and over again, expecting a different result. Right. And how many times does that happen during the day? So that would be the, that would be you and I walking the same two blocks to school every day and getting beat up by the bully. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, in, a, in the addictive world, and remember, we all have an addiction to something. We all have an addiction to something. It's when we have that drink, that drug, that slot machine handle, going back to that same troubled relationship over and over again. However, unlike Einstein's definition, we know what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen, yet what do we do anyway? Do it, we do it anyway. We continue to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And have you ever had a friend that said, Mike, why do you keep, why do you keep pursuing this relationship? It's not working and it's no good for you. I'm sure that you, that's happened to you in your life. Why are you continuing to do this? And, and this is another 12-step term that we use. You can't read the label when you're inside the bottle. Not necessarily relating to alcohol, but depression or anxiety or anything that you're involved in your life. When you're enmeshed in a situation, you can't see it. Right. But if you're able to step back and look at, perhaps you can read the label. You're too busy dealing with the day-to-day -day of the problem to realize it's a problem. Yes. It just, it just feels like a, a normalcy to you, mm -hmm. like a, 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 a status quo. You know, maybe if you're you know, at a work or have a client or have a relationship and, and uh, you're just like going, but everybody says, you know, this does not work for you, you know, and sometimes you need that. So this happens to a lot of, you're a tech guy. And what happened when you were having a few technical difficulty issues when, before we started the podcast? Um, I tried different versions of the thing that usually works and said, hey, this program's not opening by itself. Well, maybe if I go to uh, this icon over here and open it that way, you know, and there was like a, a string of things to try out. Right. However, what did work? You rebooted. Yeah. The, oh, the re. Oh, the reconnect. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and that was one of the three problems that we had. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, we. Uh, yeah, we reconnect. We rebooted, and uh, and it and it came back. So quite often, if anybody wants to go back through the podcast, we did a whole uh, series of resetting, how to reset yourself, hitting the reset button. I believe the podcast was mm -hmm. called. So the idea about that is that to continue forward continue forward and stepping back, looking at, stepping back, looking at. Okay. So came to believe that a power greater than ourselves. Okay. So this is what turns a whole lot of people off about because perhaps uh, some people may have uh, given them the misconception that uh, the 12-step process is related exactly to Christianity. However, it most certainly is not. It's about finding a power greater than yourself. Um, and if we were to change our lives and our power wasn't working, uh, wouldn't it only naturally believe that we would attempt to tap into a power that was greater than we were? because our own will was not working. And whatever that may be, there what we're talking about is a spirituality type of aspect, some type of a connection to whatever, the world around us, uh, energy beings, universe, whatever that uh, you feeling that have a connection with. So quite often we refer to the words of the Bible's Jesus or uh, the words of the prophet Muhammad uh, or uh, Jewish thought, Hindu thought. Uh, I don't want to leave any, any particular faith on, but I particularly rem remember the, the transcript translation meaning, I am that. So we've discussed this in the past also. However, it bears repeating that there's only a certain number of elements in the atomic table at this moment. So each one of these is made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, and they are further divided into the smaller type of energy units. And perhaps uh, some scientists will discover more and more. However, what we get down to is the basic level of energy, Mike. So what we're talking about when they say, I am that, um, so, um, and they do that in yoga practices quite often too, to emphasize that point, is that I am that, meaning that the same energy, the birds, the rocks, the wind, the trees, are this made the same type of energy as you are. And when we're contemplating and meditating and saying, I am that, that's a connection with everything. 
a connection with everything around you, which is one reason the Buddha forbid intentional killing. Uh, you don't cut a tree down just to cut a tree down. That one of the Christian Ten Commandments is thou shalt not kill. The same thing in in the Jewish faith. Uh, Islam forbid the forbid the killing of innocents. Uh, it's it's it all makes a lot of sense and it all it plays out in the same pond. All, all faiths basically swim in the same pool. Okay, perhaps different lengths and different heights. Uh, however, it's basically all the same thing. Please join us for further discussions on behavioral change through 12-step recovery techniques. And please connect to our link that will be provided uh, from our friend, Krish Mohan, good friend of this show and ours personally, who's a self-described social vigilante, and he has given us permission to share the last portion of a show that I myself found particularly meaningful as far as social justice and showing dignity and respect to every single person that we meet. I think the reason why we see so many extremes in our society right now is because as a country, America is a teenager. That's what we are. America has not been a country for all that long. We're a teenager, and we don't have a room to go into to let out all of our feelings, so we just let them out on the world. <laughs> That's what we do, yeah. I'll give us 300 years. 300 years is how long we've been a country, right? I'm overestimating a little bit, I know that, yeah. That's not that long to be a country. There are countries out there that have existed for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, still don't have shit figured out, right? Have a meeting about it every month. You know, and here comes America, and it's 300 years of teenage glory going, guys, don't even worry about it. Went ahead and brought my tank. <laughs> Whoa, America, we had this conversation last week, okay? You can't just keep bringing your tank to all the meetings, okay? You're, you're scaring France. Are you happy? <laughs> France is crying right now, okay? I mean, it's not that hard to make France cry, but it is the principle of the matter, okay? You can't keep bringing your tank to all the, okay, your dick is on the table. It is on the table. <laughs> you can't do that. You gotta get it off the table. It's unsanitary. You can't, you can't. Well, don't put it in Israel's mouth. Come on! <laughs> it's not nice. Okay. You know what, America? Why don't you just shut the fuck up for five minutes? For five minutes, shut the fuck up, do some actual reading, crack open a history book, and come up with some actual solutions. Okay, your dick is on the book. It is on the book. <laughs> <laughs> Teenagers are full of extreme behaviors, aren't they? Think about yourself as a teenager, right? What's a big thing your parents always told you? Don't smoke cigarettes, right? That's a big one the parents always tell. Don't smoke cigarettes, they're bad for you. What's the first thing we all do? Go down to the gas station and buy an entire carton of cigarettes. <laughs> and we go out back with our friends and we start chain smoking the shit out of them. And then about the fifth one in, you're like, mm, I should probably just smoke when I'm drunk, right? That seems like a, <laughs> <laughs> like a better idea. <laughs> smoke. If we can all just smoke when we're drunk, I think we'd be a better off society. <laughs>